Start my mm. second one. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Didn't see you there. Um, Mike from Turn Leftist, what's up? How's it going? Good to have you back. Uh, we were just talking about back. why... We were just talking about why why can't these Americans get off their ass and protest? And I wanted to add something to that because I thought one of the things is as as our the great Uncle Ted Kaczynski uh, said that we'll come to a point in the technological advancements where the kind of entertainment and the things that are available to us to placate us, like pharmacologically, uh, movies, whatever you whatever you can use to subvert the imaginations and and the attention spans of people bread and circuses you know sports you know, all, all this stuff anything to pacify the people uh will become so good at um working that people will in essence be too too placated and too soft to actually go fucking do something and i think that's about where we're at i i always tell people those antidepressants and all this add medicine it might be stopping a great Marxist cultural revolution. We don't know if that's, if those pills put you in a position where it, it just lets you be okay with the chaos around you. Maybe, maybe feeling that chaos is exactly what we need. We need to get to a point where we're just fucking shell shocked. Right. Mm-hmm. We're just like, I'll just start killing people. I don't know. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Not that I'd advocate that, but no, I mean, I think it's, um, it's also the other end of it is the desperation um, is so deep seated in people when you have grown up seeing your government and your businesses never provide for you or deliver in any kind of way. Like every product that's being sold to you is like a planned obsolescence thing that breaks so quickly, or like what you were sold was just a false bill of goods to begin with. It was just like such a, you know, we, we've all been disappointed by products and services, I'm sure. And then not to mention like your government not being able to provide infrastructure if you live here in the US. Like in Germany, we were just talking about how it's a little better, but still. Um, People extend that to the rest of the world, and that's enough to placate them too. Um, it's just the the hopelessness. Like they, I'm constantly touting the benefits of infrastructure in China and how the the big scary government over there is able to accomplish a lot of things, like build railroads across their entire country, give all their citizens, citizens universal health care, have housing that like vastly outpaces any other capitalist country. Um, yeah, and people's response to that. Even people who consider themselves like radical leftists, radically against their government and their capitalist overlords here in America, they still believe Western media and government propaganda that all of that stuff is just fake, that like China is just lying about it all or they're painting a rosy picture. But actually, everyone in China is super miserable and also brainwashed to love dictator Xi. So it's like if people are kind of like xenophobic that way and they they really are that willing to believe that people in other countries are mindless automatons it's like i don't know i mean maybe you kind of are able to be talked out of getting better conditions for yourself it was that easy you know like just making you think it's that much worse not only here but everywhere like dude that's why that's why the humanity is doomed is because if we're we're that the masses are that gullible like there's a small percentage of us that can think for ourselves and we go well they say this but let me go double check and make sure that i'm not getting led on by propaganda machine but most people just go well, they say China bad, so China bad. Uh, and they don't. And you know what? I had to deprogram myself from this idea that, like I said last time, I told Vijay Prashad, well, they're kind of authoritarian over there. And he's like, <laughs> yeah. oh, Jesus Christ. I got to deprogram another fucking American kid. Um, the walls of information around our country are thick and and they we are bombarded, saturated with uh, the, the false information. So what, what choice does the average person have but to go with whatever they heard last, which was, well, I heard they're bad over there. And in reality, we're all rooting for Elon Musk. Oh, he's going to build the Hyperloop, Hyperloop. Mm -hmm. Since he's announced the fucking Hyperloop, China has built, like you said, kilometers and kilometers of high-speed rail all over the country. And we're still waiting for this thing that's never going to actually work or be built. Um, Yeah. And like you said, the profit motive is is ridiculous to, to be the thing that dictates to people uh, or what direction humanity goes. Well, we'll let the people decide. The people will choose the most addictive substances that they can find. Yep. They will choose the stupidest shit. And they'll do it just from fear of missing out. Well, Bill has got a fucking accoutrement singing fish hanging on his wall, so I have to have one. We, we're not rational fucking people. It's just easy. I mean, like, if you were in an unregulated free market, why would you choose to build something with risk 
that could potentially fail um, when you could just be a heroin dealer. Like, why would you like it would just make more sense to be a heroin dealer because there's no risk. There's immediate reward. There's zero overhead. It's like, of course, that's what is incentivized by a free market. You know, I told my wife this the other day. I said, look, it's not that the people who dress up in suits and run everything, it's not like they don't understand that they're only here for 75, 76 years on they average. Know. They know, and they're living like it, but they're pretending like they're not, you know, and they're like, oh, we're, too, we're doing, we're, we're being proper. We're, we're getting stuff <laughs> yeah. done. We're bureaucratic. We care. No, they don't care. But the people like us who are virtuous or at least care to, hey, hey, this is fucked up. Don't do that. Is obviously you're making people suffer. They don't abide by like the most simplest for like basic ideology, which is like, I, I want to be the type of guy that grows trees for shade that I don't necessarily, I'm never going to get to enjoy. Like I want to actually build a world where I, I'm going to suffer no matter what. So it's fine. My life sucks. But if I can help somebody else, fuck. That's the only thing worth living for. I really think it is the case that there are the people like us who are real humans. And that's why people get sort of veered off into like the lizard people or like crazy conspiracies because they sort of recognize that at some level, these other people who are ruling over us are not human. They they have literally lost their humanity. Like they don't see other people as humans like themselves. They see us as lesser in some way psychologically. I don't need to analyze it. I don't need to get in their heads. I just I just know that they see us in, in some way that allows them to feel comfortable exploiting us, poisoning us, killing us, and doing all these horrible things to us on a daily basis to make their money, and they can still sleep at night. And that's enough for me to know that these people have lost their humanity, and then anything that happens to them is fine. Like there's no moral compunction in my mind about anything that happens to these people. And so that's yeah. what I'm always trying to do is just move the conversation forward because it seems like still the entire progressive movement in the West is trying to identify the moral, like just the moral lack, the lack of morality in these people, like who these enemies are. And I'm like, my whole message is like, they're everywhere. They're all over the place. That is not the problem. The problem is that you just don't want to do anything yet. And yeah. they are doing it to you. You know, it's funny. George Carlin, he's one of my favorites. He said, you know, pacifism is a nice idea, but it just might get you fucking killed. <laughs> yeah, like, dude. You, you got to fucking do something at some point. Uh, Malcolm X, uh, Martin Luther King's like, well, we'll just keep being nice about it. And he's just like, no, nah, man, I, I'll do whatever it takes. And of course, they, sh they killed the ones that are actually a threat. And they're like, oh, Martin Luther King will name all these streets after him because he didn't actually accomplish jack shit, which great guy. Don't get me wrong, but uh, we need so much more than like, like the monopoly on violence that the state has. It's like I refuse to let them have that. Yeah, well, I mean, we all are letting them have it. But did you want to get into some of this, uh, some of these articles that we brought today so we can let's uh, do it. Let's do it. Um, otherwise, we'll so get stuck in the doom loop. I love it. I love it, though. It's just, just warm up, you know, get everybody yeah. real fucking keyed up about how bad it is. Um, so this this one I just want to bring up shortly. German states outlaw displays of the letter Z, a symbol of Russian war in Ukraine. So this basically happened um, a year ago or something. And Germany doesn't have any freedom of speech laws. They're basically all just... Uh, if they think it can be perceived as some kind of hate speech, they can shut down any protests. They can sh uh, jail people for having certain emblems and stuff on their cars or on their houses. And uh, this came from Nazi times when they wanted to like erase all the swastikas everywhere. And they, well, if any, if you may bring brings a swastika in here, we got to like destroy it and destroy the people, which was an understandable thing. But as soon as you start clamping down on free speech, a bunch of people who actually want to say something important get, you know, mowed over. So this was just a quick thing that people should be aware of, even though you think you live in Germany, somehow you're, you're doing good and you're more free and everything. It's actually uh, similar. We're, we're, we're capitalists. It's, it's the same old fucking song and dance. Um, let's I go to like, this uh, one. You the headline they had just briefly at the top of that NPR thing was the, the Ukraine invasion explained. I'm going to have to go back afterwards and see what NPR's version of that events is. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm dying. Yeah. I'm sure it was non-biased and uh, 
Yeah, that, and one of the most embarrassing things since 2016 was seeing how corrupt even the liberal media looks. I, I did. I went from full on soft liberal person. Well, like anarchy and all this shit and anti-authority appealed to me, but I thought for sure that some news organization out there would be honest and say whatever, you know, be be fair. But when Bernie Sanders wasn't even mentioned, like it was obvious there was internal memos going around that said, don't talk about Bernie. Don't put him on the air. Don't, uh, you know, um, that was my f f f fast descent into fucking full on violent communism. Second time around was even worse when they had like the fucking coin tosses and shit with Pete Buttigieg. It's like it was so blatant the second time, too. What what happened then? What was what was that? Well, like the first time that they screwed Bernie, it was like exit polls were just like margins of error eight or nine times the amount that they would usually be in like polls that Bernie lost that were like key polling stations in like Michigan and stuff. It's like key races that he lost that decided whether he was the nominee or not. The margins of error were like eight to nine times. This was something like one of my old co-hosts brought up on my podcast before. But the second time around was like video stuff that was on the news. It was like people doing coin flips and then like seeing the result, like land on and then be like, uh, and then like, obviously, like just very obviously calling it for Pete Buttigieg when it was like for Bernie Sanders. And like, wow, when things come down to coin flips and delegate caucuses like that, uh, it's annoying to begin with. And it shows that your political system was a joke. But then when it gets rigged like that on live TV and then you have the evidence afterwards, because again, you look in like the the polling and you see like the rat fucking happening and then you bring that up in like liberal media outlets and no one cares like people cared even less the second time around because they knew it was going to happen so i don't know i'm always relitigating I, bernie because it was like one of the most obvious things that should have turned liberals into raving leftists but again it was just another opportunity among dozens along the line where liberals show their true colors and they decide no i'm actually fine with the way things are as long as it's working for me i don't really care this was all aesthetic for me right yeah yeah yeah, and again, I think this has everything to do with being placated by every modern kind of doodad and gizmo that tickles their balls and makes them sandwiches. Uh, anything to stay totally asleep and uh, and away from action. I mean, people are going to jail now for for this stuff, but activism and stuff is is finally popping off in in a meaningful way, like like in the '60s and stuff, like hippies on every fucking corner they were upset now we have people with kifas on every corner i hope this continues that's all we can really fucking hope for um but yeah to rochambeau for who becomes the next president like we'll do paper rock scissors come on come on guys it does not matter uh, <laughs> uh this is you sent me this this is the full text report on human rights violation in the u.s this is written by china right mm -hmm. cgtn yeah for being big and scary, they sure are building a lot of necessary infrastructure and helping people. Oh, click that uh, link where it says here for the full text to get that uh, the PDF oh, version. The dossier. <laughs> um, so here it, it breaks it down into civil and political rights become empty talk, the chronic disease of racism, the growing economic and social inequality. Wow, China's got us pegged. Persistent <laughs> violations of the rights of women and children, heart-wrenching struggles of undocumented migrants. Sure. Uh, and American hegemony creates humanitarian crises. Damn. And this is just, um, what is it, six chapters? Did you get a chance to look at it? Yeah, I skimmed through it. I didn't read the entire thing word for word, but I read all the different sections and like a couple paragraphs in each. And I definitely copied a few that stood out to me and put them in my notepad to make memes of later. Um, <laughs> like there's stuff that they do at the end about like suicide rates is like just heartbreaking. Um, I mean, it's funny because the tone, it's like, you know, when you see America talk about other countries, it's actually less scaremongery sounding than that, but it's more damning. Like it makes us sound worse, but it's less theatrical, if that makes sense. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Well, they play it down. They water it down. They say 40% um, of people uh, read above a sixth grade level. No, no, no. 60% seven, of you can only read below it so mm -hmm. now they're always trying to twist it and, and make it um uh, like the fbi stopped recording crime data at some point in 1960 something like 80 or 90 percent of all the murders were solved and now it's like 50 percent and so they just don't say it 
they just don't say it. And then they started reporting d- different crimes differently, you know, to try to get. And the thing is, if your crime rate's high, you don't get um, a good credit score with uh, international banks like the IMF or the World Bank and stuff. You're, each each country has a credit score. And so if your crime rate is high, you can get um, your credit score taken down and your, and your government or whoever won't be able to borrow at the same rate. So yeah, it's, it's, it's constantly double speak here when you talk about when they talk about themselves, of course it's fucking exaggerated and wrong. And if, but, but we have to a- average it out because China also has every motivation to exaggerate in the other direction, but we have done the research. We know the history and we've been following this a long time. The United States is the biggest threat to world peace. Right. Am I- and the cool thing about these kind of things, when you get like Chinese media like this, and you you understand the light that it, that it's painted, and you understand the author where they're coming from. That's like basic uh, tenets one hundred and one of like media liter uh, media literacy, media criticism. Right? Is you should know the author, the intended audience, and you should know the agendas of both. Right? So when you yeah. read Chinese media, you know it's going to be anti America, pro China, obviously. But then you should also apply that same standard when you read American media. And be pro-America and anti-China. So then read both. And as an American citizen, you're inundated with American media telling you the reverse of all these things, or even yeah. telling you the same statistics, but just telling you telling, telling you in a same in a different tone so that it paints it in just like a better light. So yeah, I don't think it's like, I think it's like, yeah, just basic humanity or just like a adulthood. It's like, it's what you're supposed to do as a normal person is read the both sides of it i would say it's just like read this kind of thing and then read what america has to say about it and unfortunately like american media says like i said a lot of these same things they just paint it with the tone of like oh well we have to do this or we have to do that it's like that's how all these articles end it's like we have to um do i mean if you're reading them from a leftist perspective at least it's like we have to agitate yeah. and educate and organize to like fix these problems and it's like so far we're just not seeing the level of taking of control of the levers of power to to solve most of these problems. But uh... yeah, both of these groups, both of these groups, it's like you, you are a first responder and you show up on the scene in a fucking car accident because that's what geopolitics is. It's a giant fiery car wreck. And one person saying, well, he did this and he did that. And the other person saying, well, he did that. You're supposed to take both of their uh, accounts and sort of average it out and try to make the best decision you can. And not just listen to Bill, but listen to Fred too, you know? try to figure out what the fuck is going on. RT used to actually do plenty of good work. Like they were on par with democracy now, mm. but if, well, they're trying to activate the left in the United States to <laughs> whatever, get upset during the whole Occupy thing. Russia today was a huge point of information that was coming out, telling us honest things that were going on, showing police cracking people's fucking skulls open. So, um, Let's see. Uh, I'll read a bit of this. Uh, The foreword says, The human rights situation in the United States continued to deteriorate in 2023. In the United States, human rights are becoming increasingly polarized. While the ruling minority holds political, economic, and social dominance, the majority of ordinary people are increasingly marginalized with their basic rights and freedoms being disregarded. A staggering 76% of Americans believe that their nation is headed in the wrong direction. Sounds about right to me. Um, political infighting, government dysfunction, and a governance failure in the United States have failed to protect civil and political rights. Bipartisan consensus on gun control remains elusive, contributing to a continued surge in mass shootings. And see, they don't have guns in China, right? And they somehow they don't they're not able to shoot each other to death so often. A few stabbings. Guy will yeah, run I into think, a kinder, uh, kindergarten and stab a bunch of kids or something. That's but it's rare. Yeah, I mean, like most countries that did their gun control a century or so ago it's like they just don't have the guns to begin with so the gun control conversation is very different uh as opposed to like when you're talking about the u.s it's like then you're talking about well how do you get the guns out of circulation that are already out there because there's already millions but not to yeah to uh it's a, well and i think well the other thing is people are indoctrinated with culture like cult if when the culture says that's the thing you do then then it's really hard to get the the guns away from people. But in Australia, they had a mass shooting 
what in the 90s 80s 90s and it was horrific and it killed a bunch of kids and whatever it was really sad and they all came in overnight and just traded the guns away i think there might have been some kind of i don't know you get scrap metal money from it or something they they gave them a little money or something there was also in when i grew up the guns for toys program or something where Mm. you come in you give your gun and you get a bunch of kids toys which if you're trying to kill somebody, it's not a great thing. You know, I, no. I need <laughs> those toys aren't going to cut it. Um, yeah. uh, police brutality persists. At least 1,247 uh, deaths were attributed to police violence. That's probably true. Sounds right. Marking a high since 2013. Yet law enforcement accountability s- system remains virtually non-existent. Totally true. Sorry, just real quick, let me interrupt you. I'm yeah. going to just predict now that that's going to absolutely come up um, either when Trump is campaigning or when he gets back in office. Um, 1,247 killings in 2023, marking a new high since 2013. So that's absolutely what all the Trump fanboys are going to bring up when all the left is saying, you know, Trump is giving the police new money or giving ICE more money than before. And they're going to say, well, what do you mean Trump is racist or the police are racist? Look how many they killed under Biden. And you didn't you didn't bat an eye. You didn't say anything because we have not been saying anything. (laughs) Oh, my God. That left versus right uh, argument. Red team, blue team, red team, blue team. You want red team? Oh, I don't like you. You You're blue. The reality is that Biden like ran on. He campaigned on George Floyd and like using name and likeness as like a campaign slogan and then got an office and gave the police more money, more weapons, yeah. more of everything, Dude. and then built dozens of cop cities around the country. So have you, have you seen this geriatric old mummified fucker, uh, try to pander to people now that he's running for president again? Him. It's, 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 I'll, I'll follow him and troll him on the, uh, on the Instagram or whatever, but the things he's saying at this point, who can fucking really take him seriously? Like, Oh, that climate change. We're going to figure it out if you just vote yeah. for me again. I swear. But what did you do before? We can cure Nothing. cancer. <laughs> yeah, he's making some pretty lofty claims. He's saying he's going to, we're going to Jupiter and we're going to solve homelessness. Yeah, sure. You might get to Jupiter. Um, taking up lo- less than 5% of the global population, the United States accounts for 25% of the global prison population. Now, I will say in China, they just drive to your house and kill you. That's true. And they, they don't I don't know all the stats on that. It's true. I, 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 had, I have to be honest here. I think China's doing a lot of things right, but they are still driving to people's houses and they have like a mobile execution unit for mostly murderers, but also like drug dealers and stuff like that, which I don't know about the drug dealing, but maybe the murderers. Yeah, the pedophiles. Yeah, let's that's fine. But um I don't, I also, that's a huge can of worms. Like, what do you do with these people who are fucking degenerated beyond redemption, right? We're talking about really, really violent criminals. I gotta, I mean, this is the first I've heard of the the Chinese Einsatzgruppen. (laughs) I have not heard of those until now. But (laughs) um, if that really is a thing, uh, first of all, like, I'm not going to do the debate bro uh, source, sir, but like, I am curious. Like, I want to kind of read the source. I look for but, it. Uh, I, I mean, I'll read it like after the show because I'm, I'm just curious. I don't want to see what it's all about. But like, if like the one thing I will say that I don't agree with. I mean, there's not the one thing. There's a lot of things I don't agree with, like Chinese government on. I just don't tend to voice my criticisms because I don't want to give ammunition to like right wingers. You know what I mean? I tend to like That's say this too. in like my closest of left circles. But it's like I don't like Chinese policy on like drugs as far as like how, uh, what do you call it? Conservative is it is. But I also yeah. kind of understand it in one as, one aspect because of the fucking opium wars. Because like Great Britain yeah. literally did use opium as a wedge to economically cripple China for about a century and colonialize it. So I can understand why they're a little wary of letting drugs into their culture or to get too much of a foothold. Especially also since the U.S. still for the last century has been using drugs um, to finance all of its illegal operations to pretty much create most of its black budget to cripple and decimate its own population and put like a lot of obviously put the boots on their necks. Uh, So it's like, I sort of see where China's coming from, even if I don't personally like it myself because I'm a privileged white boy who loves weed. So (laughs) that's how it is. is, 
Yeah, I'm getting. I'm sitting here getting stoned. I would hate to think when I'm like really high, somebody comes and fucking executes me just for. But uh, eh. no, but I think you're right. It's like I don't want to put too much pressure. Look, criminal justice is a fucking tough cookie to crack. Like I don't have all the answers for what to do with pedophiles. Killing them is kind of uh, sounds good, but in in reality, those laws will get who's subverted lady right in the away. nice blue pantsuit they're executing though. Oh, I think that so might not, be the. Is that like the? Um... Is that the Vietnamese one? No, that's China. No, that's the. Uh, they all look the same. All these Chinese that's Chinese still... bureaucrats. Yeah, I mean, Inside it's China's so brutal execution system with mobile injection vans and firing squads after killing most in the world. Look, this is a fucking tabloid. Okay, this it's is owned from by the Rupert Sun. Murdoch. Yeah, I trust it. <laughs> it's got to be accurate. Um. Say that I link for that, me, please, because that's hilarious. Yeah, there's a lot. There's sure. so many good meme pictures in here. <laughs> China figures out what to do with degenerate scumbags. Here, see. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh man, I mean, look, some folks gotta go. I'll say that, but look we'll at that move chart. On. Oh, I'm t- I'm definitely stealing that and replacing all the words. <laughs> I mean, I mean, in some ways, that's more humane than locking them up forever and hitting, you know, putting them in dark rooms for us. Like, they, we torture people. There is no easy answer for that, right? Hey, one of my favorite parts of the conversation we had last, I listened to it to uh, check the audio levels and everything. Um, you and I were talking about what to do with, like, litterers, and you were saying how you're, like, an eco-fascist. And in about 30 seconds, I talked you through educa- re-education rather than you immediate... Talk- <laughs> execution and you were like yeah actually i do agree with that that makes sense and it's like yeah i think a lot of us are are more in line with authoritarian communism than we might realize you know yeah yeah Yeah. and and the thing is you talk me out of killing thousands and thousands of people pretty quick and that's good a lot of those a lot of those people would be re-educated we just need the means to re-educate and i think as leftists we're really pissed that we we're all just kind of struggling internally with living in the right wing re-education all the time and feeling frustrated that we can't implement the leftist re-education that we would like to, um, because we just don't have any power to do so. We just don't have the authority. Yeah. And, and I don't know how to keep praying or wishing that hoping that I did have the abilities, but uh, definitely it just seems like humans are defect, so defective and like the idea of libertarian economics or like uh, freedom or democracy, it totally overlooks the most basic uh, laws of like sociology, which is, which stipulate very, very precisely that we are very malleable. We are very, you know, suggestible. We will, we can be brainwashed very, very easily. And we've seen that time and time again. Have you ever seen the flick? Um, uh, the Century of the Self by Adam Curtis. You should watch this movie. I'll send you these links. You love these fucking movies. But this guy, I'm going to go off a tangent here. Edward Bernays was the nephew of Sigmund Freud. He came from mm. Europe to America and became like the brains behind Madison Avenue. And he, he basically eggs convinced, and bacon for breakfast. Basically, exactly. And he convinced women to smoke for the first time before it wasn't ladylike to smoke cigarettes. And he got an ad campaign that said that they these were torches of freedom for the whole suffragette movement. If you have a cigarette, that's a little torch of freedom. And uh, sure shit, he got women to smoke. And he, his whole biography, it's like he said, his quote from him is, people are stupid. People are stupid. And uh, yeah, this is why I'm with you authoritarianism has to be examined a little bit closer. Yeah. I mean, it it almost doesn't matter. Like the ideas that you think of, it's just a matter of getting everyone to do them. And, you know, you have people like Bernays who are using that for profit. He's like, Oh, I just want to get more people to smoke cigarettes. I just need to to get them to smoke a couple and then they'll be hooked. So it doesn't matter what the reason actually is. It's like, yeah, that is kind of genius. It's diabolical, but um, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Can can you give an example of a dia, uh, uh, something that's not diabolical, but it's like an authoritarian sort of brainwashing that would be good, a re-education technique that would be for the greater good, um, and not totally coercive and like evil in some way. It's, it's like instilling in people. 
give me a couple minutes to think of something, but it's tough because so many of them, they just go against like incentives. It's like, we are too instilled with incentives. It's like, I want to say like, people should just start like, uh, in a joking way, just, uh, punching somebody who's like rich, but like make a prank out of it. Like <laughs> do it without the profit incentive. Be like, like you, you just go and like punch somebody who's rich and then take their wallet and then like throw it into traffic. Like you don't even want the money. And it's just like a prank. Oh. It's like, oh, th- it's like a YouTube I prank, bro. It. But it's like, I because you've it. like flipped over the incentives, like, and you've flipped over the societal norms, but you also didn't take anything for it personally. It's like you, like one thing that blew my mind was when I found out the police kind of don't know how to solve murders when there's no clear motive or like there's no clear, um, it's like, unless you make it really easy for them, they can't figure it the fuck out. Like, unless it's like the boyfriend killing the girlfriend who cheated on them, they're kind of stumped. Like for everybody who thinks CSI and forensic stuff is going on, it's really not like your cops are dumb and underfunded. And it's like, when people just kill random people, the cops are just like, Oh, that's, they, and they 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 dust their hands comically and they walk away like they don't give a shit, dude. Like, there's so many like societal norms that people are just resting on. They have no fucking clue, man. Yeah, I think that's it. I think that's uh, what we. And if like, what if we did this? Like, everybody who makes over a certain amount of money, like you know, a million or two million or something, that every year. People, everybody in the neighborhood goes down to city hall and they get a pail of rocks and they go, or eggs and they go down and they say, okay, everybody, it's now's the year for the great egging of the rich people. And they just go to the house and just throw pelt eggs or throw Molotovs or, or you get to go into the person's house. If, if rich people exist, you get to go raid their house once a year, you know, I mean, make it even more, make it even more immediate. Like what crypto guys are really afraid of is people realizing how crypto actually works, which is that for all the technology behind it and all the security behind how you can't hack anyone's crypto wallet and get to their Bitcoin, um, you can just take that guy out of his house and beat him with a wrench and then you have access to all his crypto. And so if people start like going, like if they find a person who has a lot of crypto and they bring them out into our version of the town square, which is like live on TikTok, and they say, look, I'm going to beat this guy up until he gives us his crypto keys and then I'm going to split the money with everybody in this live. That would, <laughs> that would go viral. Like, <laughs> that's this, that's what I'm talking about. We need to have like a social media platform that is solely for, this is all I do every day, bud. I think of ideas like these and nobody gives a shit. No one wants to listen. Nobody cares. <laughs> uh, we're going to utilize this. We're going to keep having these little brainstorming sessions. We're going to come up with something so fucking good <laughs> that's, that, that we're going we're gonna to turn some heads and people are going to be like, you know what? I'm going to try this. We're going to try this out. Uh, wealth redistribution is inevitable. Like it has to happen just as well as t- uh, Israel is temporary with the, how they like, got a few million people live there. The Muslim population of the world is 1.5 billion. Like Israel is temporary. Capitalism is temporary. This whole income inequality thing has some very simple, quick, easy fixes that uh, we, we got to get to the bottom. Of. You know what the sad part is, is that we said this last time, I think it's like th- some rich industrialist said, you can always pay one half of the population to kill the other half. And that's mm-hmm. sort of where we're stuck is the police. Oh, yeah. The police will always be the biggest obstacle to progressive, real, substantial change. And so we got to figure out a way to either get with them and, and have them understand what's at stake or, and that's who needs to be re- re-educated mostly are, are these kind of people. I, have you ever heard dialogue from people who are serving in Iraq or Afghanistan and stuff? These people are fucking sick. Like they didn't, they didn't come over here for the politics or for defending America. They came over to kill people because that's what they wanted to do. So that's, I mean, this is part of why I say like America and Americans are irredeemable because Mm. it is such a fascist country that like, I want to say like on the one hand, while the dumb brutes in the military and the, and the police are easy to control because they, they're good at following orders. Like it's literally what they do. And so in the past where that's been useful for leftist revolutionaries, when they took over the government, um, they were then able to take control of the the army, the police, and all the other 
institutions because they just took control of the government and they changed the names. And then even if begrudgingly, sometimes people went along, especially if they were then given more social services, if it came along with land reform, if you were then were, you know, you, you went from being a peasant farmer to owning your own farm collectively with your other people in your community who you knew and trusted. It's like, that's what usually coerced a lot of it along. But like in the U S <laughs> I feel like even doing that, you would still have a hard time even if like leftists took over the government, they would have to not call it leftist because yeah. so many of the police and military think that they're anti-government. Like so many of the police and military in the U S are literally libertarians that have like Gadsden flags on their trucks, and everything. And they are the boot. They are the ones who are doing the treading and they do not see the irony, but they also think that they have an ideology that's different than big government. And the way that that manifests is literally just fascism. They don't like blue hairs. They don't like liberals. They don't like lefties. Um, so they're unironically like pro-government in every way in their actions, in their day-to-day -day life, like who they work for, who they're literally supporting with their work um, of their career and their lifestyle. But they also would stop supporting that government if it were taken over by someone too liberal, too lefty or whatever. If there was some kind of like real socialist revolution that seized control of the government in the U.S., the right wing fascist police that we all know are donning the KKK hoods when they're not on duty, um, they would rebel against that government. So it's like, that's how far back the left is when, you know, people talk about like socialist revolution in America. I'm trying to explain that reality to them because they don't sometimes realize like who has already infiltrated the military, the police, the justice, like all the, the justice system. It's like, they've been doing that for decades. And I feel like leftists did not get the memo there, you know? Yeah. What do they want? I mean, they hijacked libertarianism. It went from being really cool weirdos that lived in the woods to being just fascism, essentially. And then it's they pretend like the government's the problem, but really fascism has always been about uh, industrialists, rich people going in and and trying to get to overthrow the government and put in dictatorships and stuff like that. There's always been capitalist entities behind these fascist takeovers. And yet they, they think that they're going to live some kind of libertarian dream where they're free from oppression when they're actually just sucking the boot so hard of like, they are themselves the boot squashing us. But at the same time, they got their lips wrapped around the boot of uh, corporate interests and the people that they, I mean the, the 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 kind of forces that they claim to hate the the manipulative. I mean, they're fine kind with of some corporations. Like they like um, corporations if they feel like it aligns with their interests. If it's doing something that they think it they like. If that if it triggers the libs, especially that's what they really like. Um, they don't care what the product actually is. They don't care if it's even harming them. They just know if it pisses off the liberals. If they feel like it's a corporation that's owned by the right people. Like again, it's not it's not news that the libertarians are fascist. So if they don't like a corporation because it's run by Jewish people, that's not surprising. But, um, I had, uh, yeah. the, you know, Josie, the redheaded libertarian. She's one of these, uh, talking heads. It's on the Tim pool show. She's okay. this, she's this redheaded dunce and, uh, she's a woman. And I, it was constantly ragging her because she once came out and said, well, women shouldn't be allowed to vote. I said, how the fuck are you libertarian? She calls herself the redheaded libertarian. Nothing about what she is and what they are are, are libertarian whatsoever. What they want to do is have you bend to their value system. Mm -hmm. And they say, freedom for everybody. And I want my freedom to do what I want. And if you don't like it, well, then well, I'm going to punish you. Like They're also trying to put trans the parents who want to do trans stuff to their kids. It's like, seriously, real libertarian economists have said, if you by definition of libertarians, if you want to sin, sell your child on the open market, that's fine. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's real libertarianism. And they're like, no, no, no. We want to fucking uh, get in between parents and and children, what they want to do. If they want, if some guy wants to cut his, the willy off of his, you know, son, I don't give a fuck. That's his thing. But well, that also doesn't happen. That's like, not the literally like no, no bottom surgery happens until well into adulthood anyway it's like and that's, i'm just trying to approach it from their insane point of view yeah, which yeah. is like oh they're they're mutilating the kids genitals they just always yeah. like all of their problems are fake problems yeah well if you're if you're a right-wing conservative religious fascist then yeah i understand why that upsets you but if you say you're a libertarian you're so full of fucking shit that's personal freedom 
that's that person's family and their kids has nothing to do with you. If you're libertarian, shut the fuck up, go back out to your cabin in the woods, leave everybody alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and then don't ever ask them whether or not uh, they know how the roads or the schools or the police or the national defense or anything will function in their oppression tyranny. God almighty. Uh, mm. What are you drinking there? I'm drinking a little home brewed cider here. Oh, cider. That's a good idea. Yeah. I should I get, a some bunch of, get some apples and I get some yeast and I just go to town. Brew me up some alcohol. Got my weed kombucha. here. My I haven't made cider. I got to try that. Legal German weed there. Yeah. Get in the fermenting game. It's a, it's a good game to get in. So, all right, well, we'll move on. Um, we're making good time here. I wrote this one this week. Uh, written is a rough word. A lot of this is chat GPT, but I put together some statistics and I l l turned out this thing. Uh, how pr capitalism and private equity firms killed Red Lobster. Well, this was a thing that really happened. A private equity does this thing where they go into a, a restaurant or any, any kind of industry, old folks home, uh, Greyhound bus. They recently did this too. And what they'll do is come in immediately, take over. And then what they'll do is they'll buy the business, let's say Red Lobster, with borrowed money. They'll borrow some money. They say, we're going to go in there and we're going to make a profit right away. We, we expect returns immediately. And they go in and they sell the assets. They'll sell the real estate that Red Lobster, all the stores, how many of the stores they had. They'll sell them all and immediately make this huge profit, pay off their debts, pay off um, their the people that they loan money from. Sometimes it's like uh, investors. They'll pay them off right away. And then the company itself is totally straddled with debt. Well, they don't care about what happens to the business after that. If If the business goes out of business, it doesn't matter. They've already made a, a killing with the real estate alone. And so they can just actually let that business die. And that's essentially what they've done with tons of business. Toys R Us, they did it about 15 years ago. Did the same thing, came in, stripped all the assets out of it, sold them all off, sold the real estate. Eventually they had to uh, file for bankruptcy. Red Lobster, you, same this thing. This is like a, a tangent possibly, but have you been able to get a read on why these companies allow this to happen? Like, are they just either in such dire financial straits when the offer is made that they can't say no because the board of investors or whoever is controlling their decision says like, look, this is profitable. You have to do this, even if it's going to bankrupt you and shut down the company forever yeah. in the next 15 years. Or do you think they're just not seeing it coming even after this has happened so many times? Like, well, look, I mean, we're, we're living in this time where inflation is through the roof that these, these um, consumer spending and stuff, everybody is distressed. Like uh, people aren't, this is why Target's locking up all the deodorant too, is because the loss and the inflation, everything is hitting really hard. And underneath the surface, look, where there is some deep problems with America sourcing all the stuff that it needs to survive. There is some kind of crippling problems underneath the surface that we're not seeing where uh, everything is becoming really cheap. And I don't think it's just because of greed. I think it's because literally we're running out of money and we're, the, the empire is failing. But in the case of uh, why these companies let this happen, it's like when you're in financial dire straits, you will bend and do whatever you have to do. And uh, what people... I don't know what the fucking story is like this. The CEO of Red Lobster or some, or all the shareholders said, yeah, you know, if we know that our, um, uh, you know, equity in this company is not going to increase and this, they're offering a buyout, which will give us all bonuses that we'll be able to like, you know, again, people know they only live 75, 76 years. They go, yeah, okay, I'll take it. I'm going to send you a link to um, another podcast that I really like, which is the uh, the Seriously Wrong podcast. And they've done a recent episode where they were literally just raging out, um, reading evidence of climate or um, fossil fuel exec executives, reading data back in like the 60s and 70s, knowing exactly what they were doing and planning to do to the climate 
and like knowing all the evidence and then also knowing the backlash that was going to happen, like understanding that there were going to be people who were going to be very mad at them, who were going to try to hold them accountable, possibly in international criminal courts, um, understanding the way that they were influenced in the media to create just doubt that their that the climate change was even a real thing, let alone that they were the ones causing it. Um, at every step along the way, they they all knew it was happening, continued on, and like decided, yeah, I'm going to be around 75 years, so I want to live the most lavish lifestyle I possibly can and screw anyone else after me or even during my lifestyle or during my lifetime that's going to be a victim of that. Like Exactly yeah. like you're saying. They know. They're, they're fully knowledgeable of it because these are intelligent, bright, accomplished people. Like You have to remember, these are not uh, unwitting participants. Like They, they know what they're doing. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I, I'm starting to put that picture together. I don't know what what what's about the, the, the golden rule in kindergarten. They teach us all this bullshit about loving it. When some guy's going to end up with fucking all the fucking money. I always tell this story. Uh, if a monkey, if one of the monkeys stole all the bananas from all the other monkeys. Oh, yeah. Then cool. science would be well. Scientists would be wondering, well, what's wrong with this one monkey? Why does he need to steal all the bananas from the other monkeys? In the case of humans, we put him on the cover of Forbes magazine. Like, yeah. but uh, no, I mean, look, this is just the tip of the iceberg here. Uh, speaking of petroleum, microplastics found in agriculture. Clog soil pores, prevent aeration, and cause plant roots to die. Have you been following the microplastics thing? Um, only briefly. The The thing that really stuck out to me that I heard this past week was that they want to study, like scientists would really like to study the effects of microplastics on, on humans, um, whether it's in our testicles or wherever else, but they can't find control groups. They can't find people who don't have them, so they just can't study the effects. So. Wow, that's news. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I mean, essentially, it's unavoidable. It's There's unavoidable. No <laughs> the other thing is microplastics. Plastics are all made out of different things. One of them is petroleum, but the other things are like uh, formers, hardeners, colorants, everything like this. There's all these other different cocktails of chemicals that are in these things. And these are the things that are really, really dangerous. Now, they can break down to a nano. There's microplastics and there's nanoplastics. And you can break down to a molecular level. It can get in your organs. Obviously, it's in the testicles. I, I'm sitting here scratching the microplastics, right? <laughs> right They're itchy. <laughs> yeah, my microplastics are itchy. Um, <laughs> there's uh, evidence that in wildlife, when there are birds that are eating this stuff, and it's not digesting, and it's it's fucking up their endocrine system. So it's got these endocrine disrupting qualities to it, which endocrine is just your hormonal system. So it'll disrupt the hormonal system of most animals, so they think. And the thing with the birds is that when they eat the thing and then it disrupts their hormonal process, so when they get older, as they're developing, they're supposed to be developing these great big wings so that they can fly. The birds aren't even developing big enough to like fly south for the winter. So big big uh, flocks of birds are just dying off because they've ingested this, this plastic. Anyway, it's really pervasive. It's everywhere. It's unavoidable. It's in our nuts. It's in our, gen it's in our genitalia. It's probably in your clitoris too, ladies out there, if you're listening. <laughs> um, in your memories. Check, check your memories. Check them often. Uh, it seems like this is even a bigger story than climate change. And it, it all leads back to petrochemicals. So that's my spiel. I mean, the one positive note I would leave with that is like, I remember, because uh, I'm old enough to remember news stories around 9-11. Uh, but I remember like news stories after COVID too, when things kind of shut down for like a, when like COVID just was like a news story, when people actually cared about COVID for like the first two weeks to uh to, to what was it to flatten the curve um yeah when a lot of planes shut down the day after 9 11 and a lot of businesses and just global traffic shut down uh during the first two weeks of the pandemic people were incredibly surprised at 
I remember like the canals in Venice were clearing up. It was like all of a sudden the pollution had just like disappeared from the canals in Venice and they were very yeah. clear and like people were like surprised at that. Um, other waterways were just suddenly clear. The skies were really clear after 9-11, but like people were surprised at how quickly pollution disappeared. And I think going back to like how capitalists and all of their cohorts immiserate us and make us think that a better world is not possible because they they delude us about what's going on even in other countries right now. They they make you think that it's so hopeless that like climate change is so bad and it's so baked in that you can't possibly do anything about it. So don't even bother trying. When in reality, once you shut down business for like twenty four to forty eight hours, we're already amazed. Like scientists have that sudden control group of the world without without commerce, which never happens. They have that to to view and observe, and they say, "Oh, look, we're surprised at how fast all of the world is healing itself. Like all these natural processes, which we didn't have the ability to observe because they couldn't do this before, um, we're surprised at how fast they do it." So all I'm saying is, like, if you're worried about the microplastics and all the other colorants and like the binders that are in them as well, it's like the fastest way to see how fast we could possibly get rid of them from everybody's uh, like biological material from everybody's pores and everything would be to like remove the CEOs and all the people who are still making them right this second and putting them in all your water and then just see how fast nature got rid of them. Because like, we're always amazed at how many snails and slugs and mushrooms get rid of things that we put in the in, into the environment. It's like they keep yeah. doing that. They keep impressing us with that. So we just got to give them the chance and we're just like we're 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 twiddling our thumbs instead of doing that like <laughs> yeah fungi might be the way too yeah get rid of the ceos and then you know invest everything into remediation and i think you could do it i've interviewed people that were all about oil remediation with fungi uh uh toxic waste remediation with microbes shit like this mm. oh big fan big fan um yeah i'm glad i'm glad you coming on here every week because you're saving me i, I need i need somebody to talk to that you know my pain all right yeah um i know exactly this, what uh, it's like to scream into the void yeah man and here we are we're gonna try to get some other uh wild leftist kind of weirdos to get on board uh you ever seen that flick how to how to blow up a pipeline that was a good one no i know it's um it's a book and did they make a movie as well they made a little movie. I'm a big movie guy. I like the movies. Um, yeah, they it's killer, killer flick about a bunch of cool young people that go and sabotage a, uh, you know, oil pipeline. Exactly. I have the thought kind a lot about. Um, I think it was a similar author. I don't think it was the same guy. I think it's. Uh, it might be Gerard Winstanley who did um, the book about different aspects of climate apocalypse, and he was talking about like a heat wave in India that. Pro- provokes like some kind of revolutionary scenario there um, which is like another increasingly likely scenario it seems like as time goes on but like one of the things that he pointed out in particular was like he he just theorized some group sending a rocket into space that explodes and purposely leaves a bunch of shrapnel in the atmosphere to disrupt space commerce because like satellites are a huge part it's like i keep seeing the video maybe you've seen it too it's like elon musk's starlight starlink satellites um by year and it's like starting in like 2008 when i didn't even know he was like launching a bunch of shadow a bunch of satellites back then but um it's like they're covering the globe like he has spanned the the globe with so many satellites it's unbelievable and like some people think that's impressive i think it's a little depressing considering that he's like the new howard hughes and he just like works pretty much as a cia cutout to do whatever the fuck the government wants and act like he's the private sector it's like th- there's a reason this guy fails upward his entire life it's because he has so many government contracts and weapons contracts it's like as soon as they start announcing like starlink is bringing internet around the world they also announce oh yeah we can also deliver uh drone rockets to anywhere the u.s military wants um just coincidentally it's like weird how that happens like yeah i think it's i mean it's imperative that in the biggest military industrial complex like arms manufacturers in the world warmongering pieces of shit that america is that uh everything that comes along that's technologically like the internet got started i'm sure with some military objectives in mind they say it was for academia but really and then gps i think was darpa i think a few things were darpa that were that are pervasive technologies that we use today. The military wanted them. And then you have Facebook, right? Come on. You're telling me that the CIA isn't actively trying to use social media? 
Again, Chris, I can't remember off the top of my head, but there was a certain government project that ended the same month that Facebook started, and it was like the same mission. It was like, we want to get people to input personal information about themselves and compile it in a database, but we want them to do it rather than us have to like get it from them. And then like, as they ended that, they started Facebook <laughs> the same month. It was like, <laughs> as, as soon as you Google that, like, it will, I don't know what series of words you have to put in, but you can, it, it's another right. thing Either. that conspiracy theorists love, but they just don't have a lot of concrete proof for it. Yeah, find find me that. There's plenty of stuff like that. If, if MK Ultra never would have came to light, like nobody would have ever believed that that was true. <laughs> but the thing is, to, I just prefer the ones that are out in the open. I prefer the ones that we already know about because, to me, those are radical enough that they justify whatever you think your conspiracy theory of choice would justify doing. You know what I mean? Like we already know enough stuff. It's just a matter of being willing to do it. What is yeah, this, yeah. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's family like? Like oh, that's yeah. what I mean. Like I understand that Benjamin Netanyahu is not, um, like a Middle Eastern kind of like indigenous person to to Israel, but like, what do we then then do with that information? It's like that guy's still in power right now. He's still committed. He's the Hitler of the modern day, and we're we want to quibble about his last name. It's like sure we can maybe I don't know. It's like yeah. Well, this whole thing was to prove that this particular person wasn't native. For so that any claim that he made saying that he was could be whatever dismissed, right? Mm. Because we want what we're every all these people doing trying to poke a hole in Zionism and say, look, this is obviously just a racist, inherently sort of they're trying to build an ethno state and they're no better than any kind of Islamic extremists in that way. And that if they can't call themselves a democracy in the Middle East, if they're constantly invoking all this religious nonsense where their people deserve a homeland more than other people well what about the roma gypsies like come on consistency would be nice but no I, this is polish people he is his grandfather was a zionist who came in the 1920s from from poland um well before the establishment of israel yeah i don't know we're just trying to like throw mud on this guy because we don't fucking like him you know, that's why I wrote this article. I saw this past week that um, I like I, I like to do. Uh, I like to put uh, Ben Norton in there. Ben Norton's a great guy. Yeah, he's all his he content great, is really good. He he comes on every now and again. He just blows my mind. I just let him talk. Hell yeah, Rathbone. Rathbone's great too. Yeah, he's slippery. He did. He's got to come back. Uh, he started his own show, and I said, "Well, come on this week." He's like, "Okay, I will." And I was like, "Are you on?" It's like, uh, he gets busy, well, I think. Rathbone but, I think uh, is very. Uh, I mean, I'm amazed at the guests you're getting. I would have thought like Ben Norton, Rathbone would have been hard to get on a show at all. Yeah, persistence, I guess. I had John Waters on the show, so I always lead lead with that. People go, "Well, John I had Waters. John Waters." Yeah. You know the guy. That's a, the guy like with the mustache, like. Yeah, the guy with the yeah. mustache. Yeah, I did this actually. I did the art for his. That's what started my podcast because I knew him, and he he sent me his book. I did his. Uh, I did his art for his Christmas card and for his uh, Christmas tour. And uh, hell of a guy, nice That's guy. Incredible. Called me I mean, on the I phone. I was impressed with BJ Prasad. Like, yeah, no, I mean, persist thing, persistence with most of the shit is just trying to get out there and try to keep knocking on doors. And stuff, but I did a portrait of John Waters, and I uh, put it out on the internet, and he found it. And so I get a phone call one day where I say, "Hey, hello, this is uh, John Waters' assistant. He wants to talk to you." I was like, "Yeah, right." And he's like, "He's going to call you right back." And I had to find like a number because I was in Europe. I didn't have an American number. I had to get download all these weird apps. And he called, and sure as shit, you know that voice. You remember on The Simpsons and shit. That voice yeah. is like tattooed in my brain. Uh, yeah, sure, shit. That was exciting, man. That was definitely exciting. So I always like to talk about that. Hmm. Yeah, but uh, anyway, yeah, I get some guests. Whatever. Some of them are all right. Some of them, some of them never come back. Others, you know, get all types. But uh, look, you're my favorite guest. That's the truth. I had them all, up, <laughs> my, Mike. Mike, you're my favorite, man. Thank you, bro. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, well, I mean, whatever. I'm, I'm just also glad to like. Um, I like to just make content and I feel like so much of this is just about being willing to do it 
And uh, I'm just having a really good time making content with you because, like I was said, like, saying the last time, it's about the rhythm. It's about, and it's also just about like being willing to have like good conversations and being willing to change your mind uh, about something if you encounter like new information. It's also just the great quality you're supposed to have. So, yeah, yeah, I like the rhythm too. It's got to be the repartee is good. It's bouncing like it's like ping pong. It's great. Um, so here's one from 2017 to 2020. The U.S. Department of Labor recovered three billion in stolen wages from employers. I mean, should be more. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's a nice. Uh, what do you call it? I don't want to say it's a humble brag. It's like it. It almost feels like propaganda. It's like when you consider how much has been stolen and how much continues to be stolen, it feels like a drop in the bucket. But um, you know, I'll give a golf clap. What are you going to do? You know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, here it says, wage theft takes many forms, including paying less than minimum wage, denying overtime pay, or forcing employees to work off the clock, misclassifying workers as independent contractors, and making illegal deductions from paychecks. Now, see, this is something that we've moved into, this gig economy. If all you people out there driving for Uber or whatever, Uber Eats, or you're delivering pancakes to some drunk rich guy in the middle of the morning or something – we're we're up shit creek here. You're already getting ripped off if you're a, a independent contractor for a company like that who has no accountability to you and gives you no benefits. Not so good. Um, these practices uh, disproportionately impact low wage workers, women, people of color, and immigrants who are more likely to be employed in industries with high violation rates, such as construction, hospitality, and agriculture. Yeah. Absolutely. I had, a, I had a whole expose about uh, um, people, the, the Mexicans that they import to pick berries. Like they ship them up here in buses and then they give them terrible conditions. And then people are like getting lice and catching pneumonia and dying on site in these like at Driscoll's, the place where you get your blackberries at the grocery store and stuff. So mm. fucking crazy. Um Yeah. I always include a, a, a bunch of statistics in my shit because I think that that's what hits hard with people is like hard data. So I'll, I'll write some like personal stuff and then I'll just put a chunk of data in here. So I'll read a couple of these. Uh, 2019, uh, 8,500 U.S. employees committed wage – employers committed wage theft. So robbing workers of $287 million in wages and overtime pay. Uh, wage theft now outnumbers all types of other theft in the U.S., reaching $482 million in, 200, in 2019. That's uh, 100 times more than all robberies. So, And then they bitch about crime. Uh, it's just embarrassing. Uh, I'll read a couple more here. 70% of the workers who came in early or stayed late did not receive any pay for the work performed outside their regular shift. I've been there. I've been at fucking shitty jobs where they... They're like, yeah, yeah, I know you're not on the clock, but just go out there and do it. Um, the poverty rate among workers paid below the minimum wage in the 10 most populous U.S. states is over 21%, three times higher for minimum wage workers. A lot of statistics are pointing to the fact that people who are low wage are, I don't know, feeling the fucking pinch. I'll tell you, you know, just like that working off the clock thing. The one time I did that was my first job. I worked in a movie theater and like I was at a certain age, like I was still in high school. And so I was like limited to how much I could even work. And so I remember clocking out, but like stuff still needed to get done and I didn't want my employer to get in trouble. So I would clock out and then I just finished up like another 10, 15 minutes of work. And I did that like maybe even just like two or three times. Like it really wasn't often. But then I remember coming up for like my six month or yearly review or whatever it was. And my reward for that was getting not even the full 50 cent raise, but like a 25 or 35 cent raise. And I was like, oh, um, well, I'm never doing that again, first of all. <laughs> but like, in addition to that, like, I remember when I told like, it's always like older people of color who tell you like, who really see through the bullshit of the corporate world. And they're like, yeah, don't, don't do that. Like they, they, they fooled you with some bullshit and they tell you, don't do that. Like, don't work for the the man or whatever like word they have for it because they have deciphered the true nature of capitalism just by instinct it's like yeah it's they just tell you like don't do that again don't you know this is not school this is not your parents you don't need to please your employer and to make them proud of you or anything like that and you're not getting grades like you're here for the money so like everything you're doing you were doing on the clock and you were doing things that are 
within the boundaries of what you're supposed to do on the clock according to your contract. And it's like once you actually do that, you you start having your employer by the balls a lot more than people are used to usually. <laughs> I remember they always tell you when you start up, it's like, well, we're a family here at no, uh, Kmart. <laughs> yeah. yeah, fuck you. I hate my family. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> my family are all insane. Fuck you. Yeah. Um, all right. Here's one report. Since 2020, almost two thirds of all new wealth went to the top 1%. Well, howdy doody, tell me something new. What do you, what do you think? I mean, yeah, it's not surprising at all. Yeah. I always include the picture of Jeff Bezos laughing because I think that really cuts to the core. <laughs> this is really like, what do the kids call it? Rage bait. Well, you know, it's it's only because of COVID, right? It has nothing to do with um, capitalism in general. It's just because of uh, the lockdowns that Biden did <laughs> in 2020. Yeah. What's your take on that? What, what, how did people get so rich so fast off of this one act of lockdown? Obvi or, or was it was it the free money? What was it? I mean, it was just too many factors. It's like like everything else in capitalism. It's too myriad of factors to pin down any one thing, but they all tend to work in the favor of capitalists anyway. So when people stay home and they use services that um, I guess are like tech services, and they that's mostly consolidated in like Silicon Valley and then like enriches Wall Street, it's not surprising when all the the people with fictitious capital, like the the billionaires who are the ones who make the most money off of like the least labor, it's not surprising when those are the ones who get richest the fastest and during that kind of a situation. Whereas like if I don't know, if we had some kind of like real breakdown of society that caused people to get outside, like if there was like a solar flare instead, um, and it shut down all electronics for like two weeks until they figured out how to turn everything back on. Um, you wouldn't be surprised if you saw all the poor people get suddenly rich because everybody had to start like figuring shit out right there locally to them. It's like we had the opposite of that, so it benefited the system that was already here to take advantage of that, right? It's not a mystery. Bob, Bob started growing mushrooms, and now he's just like the local mushroom <laughs> kingpin. He's so popular. <laughs> yeah, he's keeping everybody in like a three mile radius alive with his, you know. Now he is our new god. Who knew that cow dung was going to be so valuable? <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I, you're right. It's like a myriad of factors. It, it's, the free money got printed. They scooped it up in the, in, the, in the form of loans and stuff. But they did. They knew in advance that if this thing went down, they said, we got inside information that the government's about to do a, a, a huge lockdown and that's going to do this, 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 and this. Well then boom, everybody just puts their bets down while poor people, working class people everywhere just lose all their shit. And then they make out like, this is how George Soros made all of his money. The great conspiracy King. He, um, was an arbitrage deal on some, uh, forex trading some money trading he bet against the uh british pound i think and then he ended up uh being the only one who caught it became super 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 rich these guys knew the lockdowns were coming they placed their bets accordingly and well, the, sent, uh, the quote unquote they lockdowns knew, yeah well they knew they knew that uh, shutting down uh businesses would drive people out of business and then they would be forced to sell and uh yeah and that's not even it's, a conspiracy that, like that's just like business owners responding to market trends the way that they should you know if they're just astute businessmen if they just understand trends the way that they exist it's like it didn't take a genius i even heard leftist podcast saying in the first two weeks of covid that like our governments were most likely going to pay lip service to some kind of like um government response they were going to probably give us like a bit of a handout whether it was some kind of check or like assistance in some way but they were going to prioritize sending us back to work and that's exactly what they did like for whatever lockdowns we were doing it was get back to work um masks if you have to but 
more, most importantly, get back to work. So, of course, it's not a mystery that like the rich people get richer because they are the ones who own work. They're the ones who are making profit when you go to work. So it's like yeah. it wasn't people like buying more things off of Etsy with their COVID checks that like made the poor people richer. It was people like doing what they could to scrape by, but then still going to work and making their rich richer. So, of course, they got richer. And but it was but it was a power struggle on Wall Street because not every business on Wall Street made out well. What happened was you had one sector get totally decimated, like cruise lines and, and hotels, and oh, other yeah. like uh, tech companies uh, come in and steal that thunder. Where Zoom got so, you know, overvalued oh, can you imagine, yeah. overnight. And so, and I, I took my stimulus check. I put it in the fucking stock market, bro. I when it crashed, I just put Thank it all you. in. I was like free money, and then I I went from like fifteen hundred up to ten thousand, and then GameStop having to wipe me up completely out. You know what we should have yeah. done? We both should have just as podcasters applied for PPP loans, like fucking uh, Mur <laughs> Mueller. She wrote and got them because that. <laughs> Dude, like, next time. my podcast has a feud with Mueller. She wrote uh, from like Twitter, but like they. Whoever that person is, she applied for PPP loans and got like hundreds of thousands of dollars of some shit from the government to be a podcaster to cheer on Mueller, who didn't lock up Trump, like who did fucking nothing, like dude, just bro, like to be a fucking shill for Biden. Like, with if I've learned one thing in my life, it's I wish I would have learned how to do bureaucracy early on, like yeah, writing government grants begging for money, stuff like that. Like I've been okay at some form of communication with you know, official organizations and entities and stuff to, to get that. But yeah, I wish that I had the gall to go out there and do some shit like that because I'd give it all to the fucking animals or some stupid fucking shit. What do you, what do you think, Chris? You want to start uh, wrapping it up here? You have, if you uh, want. I, yeah, want if to, you um, want to. I could preview a couple of things that we could talk about the next time. If um, Unless you want to go for like a lot longer, but I have some other things that I, I would love to bring up as well. Oh, I'm could... I'm I'm here for another hour. I don't even care. It's up to you, man. Like I'm just happy that I've got some time here and I've got my drink here and got my weed over here. Do you um, want to um what pull up, you uh, to... Can I show you my Substack since we can uh read our different articles? I've only written one article, but um can, I didn't use any share. um well here, I mean you can just type it in your browser. It's just turnleftispodcast.substack.com. Okay. com. And I only have the one article. If it even comes yeah. up, let's see. The Substack probably won't. Turn left to Substack. What is it? Uh, turn left to podcast. Dot Substack. Ah, oh, I got it. <laughs> and everybody, uh, yeah, go check this article. out. Uh, if you're not already subscribed to Mike's Substack, go check it out. Turn left is podcast dot substack dot com. Uh, what? This is just this I, one. Yeah, the shifts. I, I only wrote one thing. It's like, but it's like it's long. It's pissing everybody off, <laughs> and it's just all text. I'll read it. You ready for this? Yeah, go for it, bud. See how all much right. you can get through before like we have to like stop and argue about something or something. I don't know. All right. The shift. There should be no more hand wringing about declining living conditions for today's, quote, good Germans. <laughs> Watching Americans do their best to ignore the genocide they're perpetrating certainly changes the tone in economic and political headlines, particularly in the discourse on worsening social metrics. From AOL, March 13th, 2024, nearly half of Americans earning more than 100K now report living paycheck to paycheck. Hilarious. Medium reports, December 4th, 2023, 44% of all single-family home purchases were from private investors in 23. That's my article. Uh, good. From Weipo, December 28th, 2023, America has a life expectancy crisis, but it's not a political priority. Of course it isn't. Um, Dude, your tone on. is per you're like You're like in my head Like when I wrote this. Your tone is like <laughs> perfect. I love it. <laughs> I'm a newsman at heart. Um, the majority, if not all Americans in media, operates on the assumption that the American populace should have better living and working conditions, perhaps on par with Scandinavian countries. Not a crazy thing to say. But would this still be true if you were talking about the good Germans, civilians of uh, the Third Reich? 
would we say that the people in the zone of interest deserve to have comfortable suburban lives while they ignore the screams and the fumes of genocide their taxes pay for? Now, that's quite the thing. Now you're calling out liberals. Pretty much like most of America. And like the thing that I keep coming across with like leftists is like my audience is obviously communist online, right? And so when I say this stuff, people think I'm talking about them. And they're like, well, I'm doing everything I can. I'm activating. I'm organizing. I'm like, I'm not talking about you. I'm not talking about you. Like you guys are my audience. I'm trying to galvanize you with me. I'm talking about all the people who are not outraged at the Palestinian genocide right now. I'm talking about all the people who are just ignoring this, prioritizing their mental health, and going to vote for one or two of the genocidal candidates that are running right now, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, what what can you really offer people as far as uh, action that they can do? I, or like, what's the strategy that you think is best in convincing people to move forward with like substantial actions? I mean, I don't think it has to even be substantial actions. I think like if we had a substantial change in our narrative and that's like what I'm trying to cultivate with like this article, like I'm obviously being edgy. I'm like really yeah. putting it in, in everyone's face, but it's like if we changed our narrative from begging our elites for more treats for more social programs or whatever, if we, if we stopped asking them to treat us better. And if we said, look, look, okay, now we have crossed the line. The country has gone too far in the direction of anything that we could support. Now we're saying we want to end this entirely. I think that's where actually your, your leaders and your oppressors would, would buckle. They would start to say, oh, now we're actually going to give you the social programs. And it's because we haven't, we haven't really convinced them yet that we mean that. You know what I mean? Like all of our, our death to America memes are just memes and they know that. Because they know that if we, if they offered us the health care and the student loans, we would still, we'd be like, all right, that's actually what we wanted, you know? Yeah. You're saying the culture has to reflect it. The, we have to get to a point where we're talking about it so often that the culture reflects the fact that we are unforgiving about what we stand for now. And I think I think that's fucking awesome because we really need to reject lots and lots of different things like overconsumption, conspicuous consumption. Uh, we need to wipe out certain things culturally that we do in order to get this message clear. Like only watch movies that are about fucking left wing terrorists blowing up pipelines or whatever. Be like, yes, I like this more of this. I won't go see any other movie. However, you can uh, illustrate that to the people. Fuck. Um, well, I, lo I love this. Let me let me read a little bit more. Even this comparison relies on the idea that the U.S. is less harmful than Nazi Germany, which by any objective metric isn't true. The United States military has, is an empire of over 800 global bases in an economic structure of mineral labor and wealth extraction that imposes on the global south. Now, for people that don't know, the global south is the uh, all the third world countries that we've always sort of talked badly about and said they're primitive and so we help them by stealing their stuff china is has been included in that and now the global south is actually rising up and showing us how to actually get shit done um, most americans simply think of this arrangement as two separate and unrelated sides of the american mission in global affairs that the unfortunate but necessary job of policing the world fell on the U.S. by coincidence after World War II, and this has nothing to do with the millions of people employed in sweatshops to produce cheap goods for the U.S. or other Western countries, nor anything to do with the third world's inability to develop the same pace at the, of the American or European counterparts. This is a blatantly white supremacist interpretation of recent history. Yet it is the latent belief that it is the center and reflected by the educational curricula and the journalism of neoliberal American culture. I uh, you maybe I should that's subscribe. Like, that's like basically like um what my whole journey of like discovering leftism has been. And I feel like you probably have arrived at that same kind of conclusion. It's like you realize how much of your education has been miseducation and like kind of like blatantly white supremacists in a way that you I can't, didn't realize. I can't pay you, man. Sorry. No, that's fine. I, I I want it to be free. I just <laughs> <laughs> this is I want if, if Live Journal was still a thing, I would have put this on there. 
<laughs> All right, good. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I hear you here. Let me get back to this article. <clears throat> How, I, I'll, fi I'll finish this thing. It's not that long, right? Um, 70 years later, and now it's common knowledge that Chiquita used the United States and its military to overthrow the government that threatened its profits. Talking about Guatemala, sorry, I should have mentioned my name. Um, the Banana Republics, everybody. This is, of course, when the CIA, uh, Alan Dulles was the head of the CIA. His brother, or somebody in his family, ran the United Fruit Company, and they made sure that Guatemalans were basically enslaved into giving them bananas. And they tried to say, hey, we want to use some of that land you're not using uh, because it's ours, because we're Guatemalans. And they said, okay, we're going to kill you now. Uh, not really great behavior. Um, and you know what the funny thing is? Is that they still trade arms. They did this in the 90s or something. Chiquita Banana got caught tr selling, trading arms, something. They got wrapped up in some uh, what arms trade. You got to read about that. That's crazy. Yeah. What? I did not know that. I yeah, got an episode on that shit, dude. Very, <laughs> very recent. Very recent. So wow, they dude. still, they can't help it. I think it was Colombian guns, something like that. Look it up. Wow. Cover okay. it. We'll do it next time. We'll do it next yeah, time. Man. Uh, yeah, man. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Um, and 20 years after the fact, hardly any American would disagree that invading a Middle Eastern country other than the ones the terrorists of 9-11 came from had something to do with protecting the U.S. business interests for oil to enrich Dick Cheney's PMC Corporation or both. And of course, you know, Dick Cheney was famously the CEO of Halliburton that drilled for oil in Iraq. And then he became vice president and then invaded Iraq. and basically stole the oil out of it. Oh, you can only assume that well, somebody got paid, but really it's extortion. Okay. And right now we were all witnessing an overhaul in the public sentiment regarding Israel, its genocide in Palestine and the justifications for its influence in us policy and the drain on the taxpayers. God almighty. Ain't that true? U S citizens overwhelmingly agree that the military budget is exorbitant, uh, paying for rampant corruption and that it both desperately needs, but, also will not be drastically and immediately cut. Liberals believe this for anti-war, anti-military, industrial complex, MIC reasons, usually that this money would be better spent on health care and higher education at home. And conservatives want neither of those things, but still agree that scaling back the MIC, whether for fiscal isolationist or vaguely racist notions of not wanting to police the rest of the people's world, of that seem unable to maintain peace or refrain from attacking the civilized West or because they don't want their tax dollars going somewhere else. And literally that, first. like that's, that was like my badly phrased, like I'm reading that now and I'm cringing at my phrasing of all that, but it's like literally just the conservatives, they think that the U S is using the military for like vaguely, um, what do you call it? Like noble reasons. Like we're policing the rest of the world just because they can't do it themselves because they're such brown savages they can't maintain peace it's like no bud we have the military there so that we have the sweatshops there so that you get your cheap bullshit that you're buying like that's it's not that hard to understand it's just like you have to remove the racism from it yeah yeah and and somehow conservative people are uh, become right all of a sudden and they become anti-imperialist all of a sudden just by saying america first i'm like okay Okay, <laughs> but like, but do they actually want to like have their son not have his job in like I don't know, um, fucking the Indian Ocean somewhere? It's like they probably don't. When it comes down to it, they would like they still salute the flag and stand up for that kind of thing, even if they, again, even if I they're wonder. vaguely libertarian. Like, I wonder. I would think a lot of libertarians I know that were veterans that came back from like Afghanistan and shit, and they're like. I don't know anything, but I know I hate that fucking government because it sent me over there for some bullshit I didn't, you know, agree with. And that's yeah, understandable. Yeah, I mean, if we get the conservatives on board with shutting down the bases, great. Like, that's cool. Yeah. There's a possibility that they could. Everybody's going to meet each other halfway to say, yeah, tax money going overseas to, like, fuck with other people's shit. Maybe it obviously could be better spent anywhere else, somewhere else. Or just... If they take away taxes, if you're a real libertarian conservative douche and you don't want to be taxed, 
well, then guess what? You don't get to have all the great imperialist army bases. How about that? And they go, okay, that's fine. You know? Yeah, I mean, okay, cool. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. If that's what you say, okay, bro. America first. Yeah. There's some amount of nationalism that I'm like, okay, sure. Um, Americans also know every affordable and convenient thing they buy is made somewhere else in the world. China. By someone poorer than themselves. Haiti. Uh, in conditions that they would describe as a sweatshop, Bangladesh, if they cared enough to see it. They also have at least some, if not uh, acute awareness, at the first world overconsumption and its consequences, environmental, liberal, or cultural conservative decay. Yeah, so that's that's hilarious, is that both sides of the aisle both recognize that America is in rapid decline. Then we're on our way somewhere, that's for sure. We just need you to know who's different gonna... opinions about the bad guys, or right. But uh, essentially, something will change, and there will be a power vacuum, and we just need to be there with logic and reason to fill it. Um, the living conditions of Americans. You you don't mind if I read this, right? No, not at all. I mean, I was I've been dying to get this out to anybody who will listen. So <laughs> here we go. Listen up, folks. Uh, the living conditions of Americans over roughly the next century will depend mainly on their ability to connect the following facts and act accordingly. The amount of non-military aid the West donates to developing countries is dwarfed by the return in corporate profits and cheap enslaved labor resources. Is that true? Yeah. Um, I would reference uh, Citations Needed, the podcast, another one that I really love. They had uh, Dr. Jason Hickel. It's called The Neoliberal Opti Optimism Industry. And it's basically talking about Bill Gates' um, Who's the other guy? I can't remember his name off the top of my head. He's the really curly haired guy who does all the uh, puff pieces for Bill Gates and his ilk and makes everything seem like everything's going to be great. It's not Malcolm is, Gladwell, but it's somebody like him. Peter is it? Uh, Pinker. Stephen Pinker is the guy. Stephen Pinker. Oh, I thought so. You said curly head, but I didn't know he was like a journalist or a writer. I, I mean, whatever, he, like, whatever kind of like content he produces i don't know in what form it is he may be like a I've, documentary maker I, but like i'm familiar with the dude he's a fucking psychopath he's yeah. he's just office rocker but basically the whole gist of that episode and then jason hickel's entire career is that he shows how the neoliberal version of what the u.s does as far as like donating aid that is non-military um like food or like just money in any other way um, is dwarfed by the amount that the U.S. and the West more broadly extracts from the global South in the form of like um, precious minerals. You know, we're talking about the Congo here, like the lithium that we're all going to need for the batteries and everything. Um, whether it's just the cheap labor in the sweatshops or actual enslaved labor, because we've all seen the stories of like even Nestle still to this day, like operating on slave labor. Like I think it was just last year or the year before, where companies just were bringing some kind of international court. They were like suing it because it's like if they couldn't use enslaved labor or they had to be held accountable for finding out after the fact that they were using enslaved labor, it was going to ruin their business models. So they were able to like <laughs> stave off that court decision for like the time being. And then everybody just forgot about it because like we moved on to other things. So holy shit. Oh my God. Um we got a lot to cover, my friend, in this lifetime, Mike, I'm telling you. Um uh, second point, uh, the MIC exists to protect these favorable economic relationships. This is why developing countries remain developing and never reach developed. Uh, other explanations are rooted in white supremacy. Uh, this is true. You know, uh, Russia just went into Africa for the first time to overthrow all the imperialist outposts of the United States. And for the first time ever, some African countries like Mali or one of those, Burkina Faso, are get, is going to mm -hmm. get a nuclear power plant. Niger as well. And we could have done that years ago. And, and we have USAID, the United States uh, International Development, whatever it is. It's just a front for the CIA. We don't do anything but sow chaos. We don't build, we build a church or anything and we arm a bunch of rebels and, and have them kill everybody. Um, this is also why the U.S. and the West are reviled worldwide and the, the, the targets of terrorism. It's true. Other explanations are rooted in white supremacy. <laughs> I mean, uh, again, like I'm just trying to like explain the left right dichotomy as it exists here in the U.S. Because like I feel like a lot of liberals since 2000, since 9/11, have come to realize, oh, it's because we keep bombing other countries that they keep terrorizing us. And whereas the right 20 years ago was saying they hate us for our freedom, even some of the right wing are now saying like 
oh, they actually hate us because we keep bombing them. But still, some of the right wing or even like the liberal minded people like are saying they hate us for our freedoms again uh, in regards to like Gaza. But again, we, we should like understand that's rooted in white supremacy. Like, I don't think that's. And that's the thing. Right? And, and like libertarians nowadays are just people that say, you know, I still hate gay people, but now I just don't. I'm not into bombing brown people anymore, but I'll just hate, yeah. I'll hate people domestically. <laughs> And they don't even say um, they hate gay people. They say they hate pedophiles, which is code for gay people. Yeah, right. Or they say, I hate DEI initiatives, which is just right, code right. for I hate black people. Um, <laughs> cultural enrichers. That's what they call them on Twitter. Mm. Oh, look at oh, now you, cultural enrichers, African immigrants that come in off the boat. That's what they call them. Real nice. <laughs> Fucking assholes. Um the entire structure relies on the labor of Americans, which is coerced at the threat of living in poverty conditions similar to that of developing countries. Very true. And if you don't buy into the rewards of consumerism, like, oh, but you can get every kind of frippery from Target that you want that's cheaply made and imported from China that you absolutely 100% don't need. Uh, that's your reward. You slave all day and then you go buy a, a furry toilet seat or I don't know, flat screen TV. Um, I'll give you uh you want to hear something funny? This is like one of the funniest texts I ever sent to my group chat um, because the essence of humor is like being brief with it. So I sent to my friends, I was like, I just got 14 bins for the price of one at Target. I love immigration. <laughs> <laughs> and it's because I obviously like, couldn't explain to the guy, like, I'm holding up 14 bins. I'm like, here's 14 of them. He's just like, oh, okay. And he brings up, dude. <laughs> just, I'm like, okay, cool. That's what you want to do, bro. I'm fine with it. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Look on the bright side. Yeah. Um, Americans could, right at this moment, decide in mass to voluntarily accept an equalization of consumption between developed developing and developed countries, which would actually result in an overall increased living conditions for both. Myriad thinkers in the degrowth decourse have concrete achievable methods for this. So you're a degrowth guy. That's good. I mean, not necessarily. I'm just an any action that will work as long as we do it collectively guy. That's what I am. I'm a collectivist. So I, I really don't care if the, if the collective action is the purge. I don't care if it's like, you know, intelligently structured degrowth. I don't care what it is as long as like we all do it and we all do it according to like leftist lines so that we're like doing it to the people who actually deserve it and not just like marginalized people. How do you, and, and how do you get, I think the hardest part for me is that uh, how do you get the collectivism to work without a hierarchical structure, uh, structure to, to point out what actually needs to be done, whether it's by some scientific logic or some kind of ideology that you say, Hey, we, we got to do this, this, and this, and this, That's but you trick, know sir. that you can't, that's, That's what the, the Vanguard Party is for. There, you have to have a hierarchy. And so many people in the West, because our Western brains are so against hierarchy, because like I was saying before, like all we ever know of hierarchy is oppressiveness. Like it only ever hurts us. So we just think that it's always bad just uh, by nature. When in reality, you can use hierarchy to your advantage. We just don't have good experiences with that. And every time we do see a good experience of like hierarchy being used for an anti-oppressive structure, like it's the Black Panthers or some kind of militant, um, hierarchical vanguard party um, it, they get assassinated they like our government is really good at diagnosing when those are happening really fast like before the people can realize it's going on and glom onto it the government's like oh what we see that coming we know what those look like and, and they and they scope they have the heart attack gun for a reason and that's all i'm gonna say <laughs> whoa that was a good that was a good i'll quote you on that that's fucking epic um they diagnosed them early yeah, the weathermen. I got to. I I interviewed Bill Ayers. Fucking rad, dude. Yeah. I hear. I his son did a podcast with the whole weathermen experience. They were like, what they did, who they they broke Timothy Leary out of jail. They bombed police stations. They bombed the Pentagon. Um, and to talk to that's that crazy. Guy, <laughs> that's epic. That was epic. Um, that's that's kind of the thing. I'm really shocked that they didn't get prosecuted or whatever that they didn't they are both professors bernadine dorn and bill ayers are still professors at the university of chicago and their son is a professor at the university of chicago it's amazing 
good things can happen, I guess. But uh, mm. they were hated. They were certainly hated. Um, all right, let me let me finish here. Um, but the same white supremacist indoctrination that prevents the right from the U.S. from supporting any increase in social welfare out of fear it will be abused by the undeserving brown mm. keeps both liberals and conservatives from realizing something as simple as two-week national strike. Something as easy as taking a staycation would immediately bring the government and corporate aligned oligarchy to its knees. Can it, it, it can't really be that simple. Can it, can it though? I mean, really? I mean, my next, my next couple sentences answer that. And I think I mentioned it last time when we were on here. Okay. <clears throat> Not only is it, but at multiple points over the last six months, the victims and survivors of the genocide have called desperately for exactly this precisely because it is so effective the response has been deafening silence from the West. Yes, deafening silence, the most painful kind. Uh, there, there is simply no avoiding the material reality that American taxes are paying for U.S.-made weapons to use to murder Palestinian innocents. And while many offer excuses, rightfully, about dire economic conditions making it unrealistic to take two weeks off of work, come on, you pussies, the reality is that the professional managerial class, without which whose labor the gears of global finance and trade would grind to an immediate halt, can absolutely afford to take time off of work in solidarity with victims of the bombs that they've paid for. But they are also the group most out of touch with the obvious facts about where a portion of their paycheck goes. So that's that's a good thing. Like That's a good point. Like what's keeping the managerial class they need to just be just uncomfortable enough to really finally say i'm over it yeah yeah and i, I think know. this next the next thing i'm saying here is like uh it's believing kind of the that reason why Believing that this is benign, unintentional ignorance would mean believing that in the professional class in the U.S., the most educated and successful are also the least informed about world affairs. The last able to think critically about the news at whatever level they consume it. It isn't benign. This is willful ignorance. They do not want to know because to know would mean to care and God forbid possibly have to do something, have to act. or to continue as normal, but plagued by the guilt, tainting the escapism of of creature comforts, your mashed potatoes and your cheeseburgers and your <laughs> antidepressants. I mean, so that's like the thing. Like, that's why I keep coming back on like the class position of it. It's like there's a lot of people who are desperate uh, economically who really want change, but they're also the people who are least able to because they're the most economically desperate, right? Like they ha they can least afford to take time off of work. But then there's a professional managerial class who can very easily afford to. Like they're literally spending all their time bragging on their TikToks and everything about their lifestyle, about the, the different creature comforts that they're trying out. I'm trying out this wine or this skincare routine or whatever it is. It's like those people can afford to take two weeks off of work. They might even be in a position they might not because of their careers. Like they may be in a position where they could make it clear that they were doing it out of solidarity for the the genocide that's going on i think a lot more people than are willing to admit could make a political statement at work some people might get fired for it but again that's like how culture could shift and the fact that like there's a whole class of people who are running the levers like the administrative part of the u.s and they're not uncomfortable enough to even consider doing that yet well let's let's I'm, talk turkey man how do we get them motivated Let's hear I some mean, ideas. I'm, I'm just trying to say, like, that's where leftist organizing, I think, should start focusing. It's like, rather than try to protest outside the um, inaccessible leaders' houses or, like, on the campuses where the police come and get you, it's like, what if you ju just start connecting the dots that, like, everyone who has a comfortable suburban lifestyle or every corporate building is guilty, and then you start moving from there? You know what I mean? You Ooh. start, like... I love it. Have you ever been to a small town USA? I don't know where where you say you're around Lake Erie or something. Do you you've been through Middle America and seen like little small towns, right? Yeah. Walmart's are the only hub where people can get employment and food, right? But 
I mean, stuff like Denny's, like if, if everybody in town across the country, every town said, we're not fucking going to Denny's anymore. And we're not, we're not working at Denny's. And we just refused saying if, if the last thing I'm ever going to do is work at Denny's and nobody crossed the picket line and nobody like, and everybody hung tough. You could probably kill off Denny's in a fucking week. Right. I mean, the food's terrible anyway. Right. I mean, another thing that I think about all the time is like, what if people had like, um, it could start out small. It could be as small as like a discord server or like whatever kind of group chat you have going on. But like people decide to, this is again, an idea I got from back in the day. Um, I don't know if you were an Opie and Anthony listener, but like, I really loved it. And I remember like one time Jim Norton, the comedian who was on that show had a real problem with Dell, the computer company. They like really sold him a bad computer and then they wouldn't make good on it. He tried to return it and they were like giving him the runaround. So he was like, look, I'm going to give you one chance to like make this right by me, but I'm just going to let you know in a kind of roundabout way. Like I have like a following, I have some media, like they'll harass you if I, if I let them know that you're like really screwing me over on this product and they just, they still did anyway. So he made the mistake of like saying to his just virulent, virulent, the worst vitriolic fan base you could possibly have the opening Anthony listeners. He said, (laughs) Dell is really not making it right for me. So they harassed these people, these poor customer service representatives until the company Dell like was aware of that show and like what was going on and like had to apologize to him and they gave him like some stuff or whatever and like he called it off. But like he called like some customer service representative like the next day and they were like, oh, they just sounded tired. They were like, what do you want? Like where they were just exasperated. They didn't know what else to do because they had just been harassed for for so much. Dude, so my point in all this is, is like, What if you just get people to decide one company a day or one company a week? It has screwed over this person who is in our group chat and we are going to harass them nonstop until they make it right by this person. And then the next day you pick another company or like if you want to. And then if that like takes off, if people start like getting beyond helping one person with their customer service issue or they get to helping one person out of an eviction or they get to shutting down an entire company within a day, it's like. You could expand this, but the whole thing is it just has to be a coordinated collective action. Dude, you're talking about, you're talking my language. Like, we'll, we'll talk after this so we don't incriminate ourselves on something more, more serious. But uh, this is a good idea. I've done similar stuff to this and, and come up on top with some some money. So uh, it, when you go after certain businesses for certain reasons, certain corporations for certain reasons, and they have a, 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 a mechanisms in place to just quickly get rid of you via yeah. cash payoff. You know, you say, well, I found this in my box of Cheerios. There's a big whatever, whatever in there. Well, I'll tell you a story after we get done. Okay. Uh, but I think, I think this is the way to go. Tr- troll armies that go out there and ideologically do what we know already go. that 80 uh, – Unit 8500 and the CIA are doing the NAFO trolls and all these. Uh, you go out mm. there with your buddies with a distinct target in mind to either educate a person or to actually um, penetrate, extort, so, you know, some kind of something powerful, a powerful statement against one of these entities that we're talking about. Complain, complain to customer service over and over and over and over and over until you get some kind of um, response. I mean, I'll tell you some stories after that. Um, I just want to, is this, is this keep going? Middle class white people actually pride themselves on being able to compartmentalize and avoid unnecessary conflict. They'll explain how they do it, how they don't watch the news and don't talk about politics how they'll sooner abandon someone that they have a difficult conversation. I mean, this is kind of just like most liberals in America, I think are like, if they're not aware of the genocide, it's because they're not the type of person who wants to see what they would consider like gore footage or something. It's like, but my point is, it's like your country has shifted to the point where it's now putting that footage. It's just, that is the mainstream footage. That's like what your government is doing. Like we've never had this live streamed of a genocide. So if you, if your country has shifted so far right and you have not moved from where you were, you have also shifted further right, whether you realized it or not. 
And that's even my point in addressing like leftists with their organizing. It's like, if we are still peacefully protesting as the genocide is going on, well, then we have kind of shifted a little further to the right, haven't we? Because we are doing the same thing that we were doing for protests about shutting down a pipeline or something or like anything else. It's like, this is a different thing. So that's what I'm saying when I'm talking about the shift. It's like. And, and and what keeps them placated on that is the fact that we have the culture war and this uh, this idea that we're oh no that we're fighting for people to be included in this thing and we we're trying to make everything okay with gays and 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 no more racism and stuff and but which is all theater in reality nothing is being done to cure these problems because the root of it is is capitalism and inequities within a, that kind of com- overly competitive system uh, but then I mean. I don't know. There's nothing left. Um, you don't have to read the rest of this if you want, but like you are mostly done with it. I mean, like the rest of it is summed up as basically like the bad outcome. It's like if we just continue doing what we're doing the way we are doing it, the outcome is more climate apocalypse, but like not for everyone. It's like the billionaires are going to some, like some of them are going to survive the climate apocalypse or even some like um, fringe elements on the side who just like, got lucky it's like in every really apocalyptic event that's happened in human history there have been some people some groups who were just they picked the right path early and they weren't they didn't know it at the time they just picked whatever felt natural to them and it ended up being the thing that kept them alive for the next 500 years whereas like everyone around them did not survive um i was listening to a podcast this like past week about some of the original colonization that happened in the middle east and how It was like some people in what is now Gaza originally sided with English people when they started coming in and colonizing um, simply because it was beneficial to them in some kind of like tribal war they were having. And they ended up being like some of the people who still have families in that area today just by happenstance of like having that decision made 500, 700 years ago or whatever it was. Um, But like that's the kind of thing that's going to happen with climate change too. It's like as crops fail in different conditions, like certain people are going to figure out different things that work. People may go underground or build some kind of like crazy structures that keep things safe from the elements. But like the ones who just kind of stumble upon that early um, will be the ones that survive. And then societies that build that kind of infrastructure for all of their people, rather than like, like right now our billionaires are telling us that they're, 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 doing it they're rubbing it in our faces they're building the bunkers they're telling us all of their plans for this coming apocalyptic condition and we're letting them do it so it's like the societies that have more of a collective vision which are by nature by definition the socialist societies are also making clear their plans to feed a billion people if if they're able to do it and they may not reach that goal but they're going to do better than the ones that are the, the the society that is trying to build socialism by 2050 is going to do better than the one that is ed, like adamantly opposed to building socialism ever. That is like purposely anti-socialist in all of its goals, right? It's like yeah. if, if we see that collectivism is going to be the way out of this. Have you, have you ever heard of Douglas Rushkoff? I feel like I've heard the name, but I'm not familiar with this stuff now. He he! I had him on the show. I was dying to get him on the show. He wrote this book. He had actually had written about tech a long time. He's written lots and lots of books, and uh, he got called to a conference where billionaires were supposed to be. Oh and it yeah! It was like, and it was like you can either like go uh, skinny dipping with you know Tom Hanks or something. You know, it's like, or you can go listen to Douglas Rushkoff talk. And so the people went and um, listened to him talk, and he started with his idea what the future might be because he's always predicting the future and then they started peppering him with questions like well what do we do when the uh, world starts ending and we do should we should we get well do i get like struggling to think of how to pay their guards and motivate them if there was like an apocalypse and they couldn't pay them right exactly and they say what do we do we put shock collars on them um and then he th- he was like, "What are you talking about? You're these Navy SEALs after the world world's already ended. How, why would they be obedient to you? There's no no reason. So essentially, it's like whoever's strongest always wins. This is why military uh, dictatorships always pop up after a power vacuum after a coup is because it's whoever's got the guns, whoever's willing to use the violence, whoever's more 
cohesive as a as a unit based on some kind of ideology, that's going to be who who ultimately rules. I mean, that's any who, that's who survives like the initial cataclysmic event, right? But that's not who survives in the long run. It's whoever is able to build like a community. It's like they're the people who like have the undignified conditions that they don't make movies and TV shows about who have to like, you know, scrounge for a living, who are like the scavenger people left over after that, after all like the aggressive, uh, what do you call it? Brutes have killed each other. Cause it's yeah. like, I, I mean, I really like all the apocalyptic shows that are coming out. I really liked, uh, the last of us when that was out. Oh, that was good. Um, the thing that I, I, really remember from that was of course the commune when they just stumbled upon like the people who even said outright like no we're communists this is a commune and they had like a really well-functioning society but i also thought it was really cool how they pointed out the amount of people who would pose as uh being hurt or like roadside like victims or something and then pounce on the people that stopped to help them and then like kill them yeah. or take their stuff and how even the hero of the show admitted having to having done that in the past like in his previous um iteration of what he was doing in the apocalypse it's like that's the kind of thing like when i say and you were saying last time we were talking like leftists need to be prepared to use dirty tricks because the people are always are yeah. already using dirty tricks against us yeah that's why i'm openly telling people I, i'm i'm happy to be like the leftist rupert murdoch where i just get my base keyed up to a point where they just do what's right rather than wait it's t sitting on your hands it's really fucking embarrassing you guys are embarrassing. It's embarrassing to say you're leftist because you guys are all a bunch of spineless human beings. It Damn does seem like leftist. a lot of leftism is like just addiction to losing. It's like aversion to things that are effective and then calling them fascist, either because it's easier than to try to engage in those things and do them, or because you have like legit paranoia that like everything that sounds effective is like a fed up, right? Yeah. And people that aren't paying attention to what they're consuming. Like you have to have some kind of make some kind of concessions to what you consume in your life, whether it's food or where you go or like taking a jet to a climate change summit or, you know, shit like this. Eh, it's not great. It's not great. There has to be concessions you have to make to live the walk, the walk. And But like, another point I wanted to that I do make in this last section, I don't know if I articulate it really well, but. A couple of things I think about, and that I know I put in here about how when Columbus first arrived in Hispaniola and started like meeting and then almost immediately enslaving indigenous people, it wasn't long until these white Spaniards were just riding indigenous people like for transportation because they got so lazy so fast. They were like, wow, we can just exploit these people. So we'll just do this. Like, why not? Um, but also, what do you mean, I, like, I think, like a piggyback ride? Yeah, like literally, just like you got to carry me, bro. Like, <laughs> I just don't feel like walking. Like, <laughs> oh Jesus Christ! Because <sighs> um, they didn't. I don't think they had horses yet. Like, they weren't able to bring any over in the first trip, and I don't think they're native to um to the Americas, to Turtle Island. I don't think there's oh they were horses, but um. But carry another thing me. I think about is like how the Holocaust happened. It's like there were people. There were people who knew that like. There were concentration camps. There were ghettos that people lived in. And there were only a few ghetto uprisings. There was the in, the transatlantic slave trade. It's like, I only say this to, to really stress that there is no level of conditions that will naturally result in a revolt. And I feel like a lot of people, again, based on movies and TV upbringing, feel in their sort of leftist mind that if things just get bad enough, people will naturally revolt. And I and I can't stress enough how that is not a real thing. Well, dude, you know what happens when you put a frog in in boiling water? He jumps right. right out, but you have to put him in the pot when it's cold and slowly heat it up, and he just he'll just sit there until he's just a little Kentucky Fried frog. I mean, they sound cliche, but like that and the crabs in a bucket analogy, where like they point someone pointed out that like crabs will just attack each other and pull each other down rather than like collectively work for better conditions it's like that is kind of the thing right like that they sound like too. it sounds like joe rogan stuff but like they're both right like frogs will not notice um i, I don't even know if that's true like i've heard like debunks of like frogs like people of course for youtube like i'm gonna try to boil this frog bro <laughs> like but like I, I it doesn't matter like the analogy is the important part <laughs> 
Well, we don't have a frog. Well, what do we got? We got the cat. <laughs> uh, well, all right, bring him over. All right, next time Jesus. we're blowing some frogs, bro. <laughs> I brought a whole bunch of frogs from home, man. Oh, God. As a vegan, I'm outraged. Yeah, um, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, well, I mean, look, we did pretty good. We're going to come back and do this again. I'm going to cut this up into several segments. We'll come in back next time. We'll, we'll talk about the CIA. What do you want to talk about next time? Yeah, let's talk about like Operation Gladio. We could talk about uh, Henry Ford and the Independent, like the fascist newspaper that he started disseminating. We could talk about Quintel Pro and the Black Panthers. I have like full developed essays written on both of those topics. We mm. could talk about uh, any number of things. But yeah, I just know that we're going to make some good content. We have a good rhythm, man. I like it. I like it too. I tell you what we'll do. We'll, we'll sign off to all these people and we'll talk right after. Sounds good. All right, everybody. If you're still listening, God bless you. Godspeed. Good night. Go vegan. Go fuck yourself. Buy a gun. Get ready for the revolution. Good night.